The ways in which a log is processed and sliced into lumber can greatly impact your project. Today we'll go over different milling methods and why they matter. I think that most of us know the process that brings us lumber. Some burly bearded woodsman cuts a tree down, lays it on its side, and runs it through a giant circular blade, and we pick it up at the store. At least that's how I envisioned it. For accuracy, let me show you a more modern way that this process is done. A machine called a forest harvester grips the base of a tree, a chainsaw cuts through the tree bark, and divides it from the base. The tree is pulled into delimbing blades that strips the tree of all its branches. As the wheels move the trunk forward to cut, it also calculates the distance for the next cut. The logs are collected and brought to the mill and run through a debarker and cut before being sorted. The kiln is the last step in the cycle. Just as the first misconception was for me that all trees are manually brought down, there's another misconception that goes along with how a log is cut. You might think a log is cut from the top to the bottom, but there's actually a little more to it. And as I mentioned earlier, why and how these methods are used can really affect your project. Those two effects are either look or stability of the boards you use. So now we'll go through the three different cutting methods. The first method to sawing a log is cutting from the top, lowering the blade, and cutting again. This method is called live sawn and colloquially is cutting through and through. You might have seen fireplace mantles or tables built that have both the sapwood and the hardwood, as well as the edge of the tree. This is from that cut. Probably the best advantage to live sawing, besides it being as easy as it is to cut, is the amount of wood that comes from the log. The only ways you're cutting out are the edges to square up each board as well as the curve for each cut. The visual disadvantage to live sign is the uneven lumber you'll get from the tree. So this is the end of the log right here. I'm gonna go ahead and spread these out. When we split this up, you can see that the figure isn't the same among all the boards. This cathedral look, for example, is much more pronounced here than over here. You'll also find that each piece has both the straight grains as well as the arch shape. If you were to cut this into flooring and lay each board side by side, you'd have a very common look throughout the floor. If you use a piece for a mantle, it would look rustic and it makes sense. But if you were to rip each of these boards into thinner pieces, each strip that you've ripped out will have a hard time blending with the next piece. Another problem that you run into with this method is the way in which the lumber dries and, and later how it absorbs and releases moisture. Because of the tangential rings, different areas of the log will dry differently. In some places where the grains are tight and nearly vertical, you'll get very minimal shrinkage while rings that are more spread out, like this, will absorb more moisture and tend to want to cup. The second method is plain sawn or flat sawn. With this method, the outside of the bark is stripped away before it is rotated and cut. The sawyer might choose to cut a few boards off each side before rotating, but it's cut in a circular motion. Because you're turning the stock as you cut, it's often called sawing around the log. Here's the end of the log, and we'll spread these out again. The first thing you'll notice is how uniform the pieces are. While the pieces don't look identical, they all have that familiar wood pattern. Cutting around a log gives us these angles on each piece that are between zero and 45 degrees. The advantage to this method is a much more uniform look, as well as the curved grain that gives us the arch look. Besides aesthetics, the wood will move uniformly among other pieces that are plain sawn as it dries and later absorbs and releases moisture. I have found some research that states that due to the open figure grain, it is more susceptible to accepting stains and finishes. This is also the industry standard for lumber cutting due to uniformity and you'll end up paying less for lumber. The stability of this wood is a bit of a mixed bag. This is the most unstable sawn method and lumber cut this way is more likely to cup, twist or bow due to the open tangential grains. Moisture permeability due to those open grains means that it accepts and releases more moisture which means more movement. Boards cut in this way cup the opposite way due to the growth rings as the face closest to the outside of the tree dries quicker than the opposite face. What's really interesting about plain sawn lumber is that even though there's a knot on the face of the board, it's actually far more stable than if this were a quarter sawn. It would be the equivalent of having a knot through the side here. In construction, all wood is done in this method because again, it's much more structurally sturdy than doing it any other way. Our final method creates what is known as quarter and rift sawn lumber. While there are newer methods to producing both types of wood, I'm gonna focus on the classic way that these cuts are made. As the name implies, our log is ripped in half, cut in half again until you get the four quarters. With each slice now, the log will be rotated on its quarter side and cut. If we look at the log, you can see the four quarters that we've got here. Of this entire quarter section of the log, the only true quarter section of this log is this section right here. 
If you've ever bought quarter sawn lumber and wondered why it was so expensive, it's because the boards are narrow and there's very little of them in a tree. The advantage of this visually are the medullary rays that can be stunning on some wood species, in particular oak. This is kind of one of those love it or hate it looks. Some really like the look and compare it to tiger stripes, while others find it distracting. Setting the visual aspects aside, quarter sun lumber is the most stable part of a log. Because each of the growth rings are close to 90 degrees, the stack layers are more even as they dry and resist moisture acceptance by about 50% compared to the plain saw method. If you're planning on doing a floating shelf, a quarter sawn piece of lumber would be less likely to give you problems in the long run. Structurally, quarter sawn lumber does much more poorly with knots compared to plain sawn. Other significant drawbacks to this method is the cost as you're getting the plus shape of the log. Expect higher prices and less to choose from when buying these. The second product of the quarter sawn cut will give us rift sawn or bastard sawn lumber. If we look at the quarter sawn pieces, you'll see that it's the very inner part of the quarter sawn cut that is considered rift sawn. The growth rings to these are between 30 degrees and 60 degrees. While rift sawn is very similar to quarter sawn, there are some differences. Visually, you'll see a more tight grain look like stripes. Gone are any traces of the cathedral arches or the medullary ray patterns. But those lack of details can actually be a good thing. For example, if you're looking to add legs to a table, rift sawn boards will give you straight, uniform grains on all four sides. That means you won't have a giant cathedral pattern on one leg and perpendicular have straight grain. Structurally, rift sawn lumber is very stable but not as stable as quarter sawn. And just like quarter sawn lumber, branches or knots in the trees can also create structural failures. Some of the other disadvantages for this cut are the short width pieces that you're getting as there's not really a whole lot to choose from from the end of that quarter sawn. While quarter sawn lumber is limited due to it coming from the center of the tree, rift sawn is far less wide. Even though there's far less of the rift sawn than quarter, it can actually be cheaper as it is a byproduct of the quartering process but this is all gonna depend on the Sawyer that you go to. Thank you so much for watching, and what motivates your lumber purchases? Are you more interested in saving money, stability, or the figure? Let me know in the comments what the most important thing you look for when you purchase lumber. I want to thank my buddy Josh at Topper Machine for letting me use his circular blade clip. Link to his channels in the description. Subscribe and tell him I sent you. I want to thank my dedicated patrons, as well as invite you to become a patron for early access and upcoming projects. Thank you, Michelle B, Keith Current, William L. McNally, Jerry Adams, Tommy QR, Zach Finch, Rich Lightfoot, and Tudor the Barbarian. Hit the thumbs up, subscribe, and ring that bell. And I thank you so much for being a part of my shop. Please leave a comment below. Come find me on Instagram at Makings with Rob. And remember to keep making things.